Uh, tonight, I hope you have your Bibles with you. We're going to be in Exodus, Joshua, and the New Testament. Exodus, Joshua, and the New Testament. And uh, the message, somebody asked me, so I assumed it was behind me, but it's not. Message title is, uh, believe it or not, God Will Make a Way. So I asked Steve if we could sing that song and... and uh, you know, uh, we, we use this kind of terminology all the time. Sometimes we don't think about it. So tonight we're going to look about that. You know, uh, maybe this has never happened to you. You ever have a, a, a plan for a vacation trip and absolutely everything, I mean everything, went wrong? You know, you, you, you had a, a really good plan, a good, good strategy, and every single thing that could go wrong went wrong. I've talked to people, you know, the stories that I've heard, and we've, we've had a few. We did have five kids, so we know a little bit about that kind of stuff. Um, you know, sometimes you get there, sometimes you don't. <laughs> sometimes you need divine intervention to get there. Um, you know, it's, it's, for some of us, it, we're in a category now where we have long-range plans all of our life. You know, long-range plans. We're going to get to this point. We're going to retire and we're going to possibly re relocate, and we're going to relax. And you know, that doesn't always work out the way it's supposed to either. It, it just doesn't. Uh, life's full of roadblocks. And uh, that sometimes keeps us from realizing all of the, the things we want to realize. Some of those roadblocks are tangible. Some of those roadblocks are not. Some of them are actually very personal uh, roadblocks. And, and tonight, we're going to look at a nation Israel, a fledgling nation of Israel on the cusp of the promised land, getting ready to come in and possess the land. Well, they have to get out of Egypt first. And, uh, you know, they faced a lot of obstacles getting out of Egypt. They faced a lot of obstacles while they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And they fixed, faced a lot of obstacles when they, when they got to the promised land. But the thing is, God had a plan. And God was able to make a way where there seemed to be no way. Now, we could spend all night talking about the many things that God did during this, this sojourn, but we're not going to. We're going to concentrate on, on two things that I believe show us how God made a way where there seemed to be no way. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about you and I, okay? And I think, first of all, you're going to see that there is a spiritual application. We know that there is also a practical application. So stay with me, if you will, as we talk about God will make a way. Father, we thank you for your word, for all that it teaches us. Uh, we pray, Father, that tonight as we handle your word, that we do so uh, responsibly. Guide us uh, in our thoughts by your Holy Spirit so that we can see the truth and having seen it, apply it to our lives, that we might live more and more in the image of Jesus, our Savior. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 14. As we, you know, the, the, the first obstacle is they needed a way out of Egypt. They needed a way out of Egypt. Now, God had already performed numerous miracles in the form of plagues to get Pharaoh to allow the children of Israel, after, after all these years of bondage, 400 years as slaves in Egypt, they were a very cheap workforce, and they needed the, the, the workforce for the many building programs that they had going on in Egypt in that era. And so, you know, they, uh, they, the Pharaoh wasn't going to just up and say, oh, yeah, go ahead and go. And so God had to perform miracles uh, through, the, through the plagues to get Pharaoh's attention. Unfortunately, they were, they were successively worse. Uh, eventually got, got Pharaoh's attention uh, with the death of the firstborn. Told you guys, told him, get out of here. Just go on, get out of here. I'm, I'm tired of you guys. I'm tired of seeing Moses. Can you imagine every time Moses would walk in there, he said, not him again. Yeah, I think it's funny because the Bible says at one point, he says, Moses, if you ever come before me again, it'll be the last thing you do. But Moses kept coming back anyway. You see, God was with him. God made a way where there was no way. He got before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh didn't like it one bit, but he finally had to cave in. He said, look, just get out of here. And when they left, they plundered the Egyptian people. They didn't, they didn't go steal nothing from them. The people of Egypt threw the stuff at him. Say, here, take some gold, take some dishes, take whatever you want, you know. And, uh, and so they, they left. And uh, you, you think, okay, everything's going great. 
until Pharaoh has a change of heart. He wakes up and he says, look, it can't get any worse than it is now. Let's go pick them back up. Let's drag them back here. We're not going to let this stand. You know, and I've got to believe that there was some ego going on with Pharaoh. You know, probably one of the most powerful people in the world of that era. And he had let these, these guys just, just up and leave. And I'm, I, can you imagine what some of the people in the kingdom were saying? You know, fortunately, he did not live in a democratic society or he might have got impeached. But anyway, there's a little bit of pride going on and, he, and, and some practicality, and so he goes after him. Now, Pharaoh's army at that time was a very substantial army, not just in, in manpower, but in, in uh, technological advances. They had a lot of chariots. Chariots were highly valued in that time. They had a lot of horses, and horses very valued at that time. Not everybody had horses and chariots. Uh, they were highly trained. They were very efficient. And, and, you know, so the, the, the odds were in their favor that they were going to be able to get them and drag them back. Remember, this is a, a probably somewhere between estimates range from a million to three million people all told. Okay, plus livestock and supplies and all that kind of stuff. And, and so they're not going to be moving real fast. And Pharaoh honestly does believe, he's I'm going to get them. And so they're, they're, it appears that they're wandering lost, but they're really not. They're going exactly where God tells them to go. Go here first, then go here, then go here. And they're actually not taking the most uh, direct route out of Egypt. The most direct route would be kind of a northeastern route. They wouldn't have had to cross any bodies of water. The problem with that is it's also the most traveled route out of Egypt and highly guarded by Pharaoh's forces. God's smart. We're going to go another way. You're not going to see this coming. We're going to go down, and we're going to go southeast, and we're going to run into water. And Pharaoh's going to think, I got you now, buddy. Exodus 14, verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to God. And then... They said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Now, God has worked all these miracles, you know, you know, do you believe in God? I, I, I got to believe Moses. Do you believe in God or not? I mean, what have you seen that tells you that God can handle this? But all they see is a body of water on one side and the forces of Pharaoh on the other. And he's gaining. He's gaining on them. They said, you know what? It would have been better for us to have stayed in Egypt as slaves than to come out here and die in the wilderness. That's not the first time they said that. It won't be the last. When, when Moses first went and said, God says, I'm going to take you out of here. We're going, to, we're going to send you back to the promised land. They said, okay, great. And the first time that he did something and Pharaoh didn't like it, he said, double their workload. And they grumbled and complained and said, thanks a lot, Moses. <laughs> Have you ever tried to help somebody? <laughs> and it not work out the way that they wanted it? And they blame you? How many of you have kids? They were mad. I said, look, you know, here's part of the problem, folks. Bondage in Egypt had been going on for so long, it had become routine. It had become the way of life. It wasn't always that way, but after generation, after generation. And, the, and frankly, the children of Israel prospered somewhat uh, physically while they were there. They gained uh, flocks and herds, you know, and it became acceptable to be a slave in Egypt. We hear the word slavery and we have all kinds of pictures in our minds. So why would it ever be acceptable to be a slave? But it became acceptable to be a slave in Egypt. It's just the way things are. And the very first time things didn't go their way, they say, hey, get out of here, man. Leave us alone. It was better off before you got here. 
twice during the wilderness wandering, they would say the same almost exact words when they ran out of food and when they ran out of water. You brought us out here to die of starvation. You brought us out here to die of thirst. Been better to be back in Egypt. I'm planting seeds here right now, okay? When God makes a way and God provides a great gift for us, we, we jump on it. But then the first time something goes wrong, we want to go back. Back to Egypt. And Moses said to the people, verse 13, do not be afraid. Look, now, now here's what he says, okay? Don't be afraid. You've got to be kidding me, okay? But he says, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I'm not positive Moses knew exactly what was going to happen at this moment. But he did know that God said, I'm going to bring them into the promised land, and you go where I tell you to go, and it's going to happen. And Moses said, listen, don't be afraid. Our God is bigger than Pharaoh and his armies. Stand still. You don't have to do a thing. Just stand still and watch God in action. Man, that's powerful stuff. It says in 14, the Lord, oh, excuse me, 13, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, for he will accomplish for you today the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see them again. He's going to take care of them. Moses just believes this. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. That literally means keep quiet. Just don't say nothing. Or we might say, shut up. Verse 15, And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. <laughs> Yeah, tell them to go forward. But lift up your rod, stretch it out over the hand, uh, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. The wording actually is their feet will walk on dry land. Now that, that's important to remember here, okay? They didn't just get across. Their feet would walk on dry land. That's powerful stuff. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. Now skip over to verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. I got to believe that none of the people there had ever seen anything like this before. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea. We don't know how far the waters parted. This is probably a narrower point of exit on the, on the it's actually Sea of Reeds, often called the Red Sea, but that's okay. It's the same place. And, it, and there are some narrow areas, but it's still a lot of water. You still can't get across it with a million people and kids and baggage and the rest of that stuff. So the, the idea is probably when God separated the sea, it wasn't this little narrow passage like we see in the Ten Commandments. Okay, that would have taken three days to get through that. But probably a very wide stretch. And they're standing on the banks, and they didn't waste no time. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were walled to them on their right hand and on their left. And of course, Pharaoh's thinking, okay, well, they got a head start on us, but if they can do it, we can do it. And they tried to do the same thing, and of course, we know the story. God said, no, he'd already said, I will be glorified by, by Pharaoh and his and his." horsemen and his chariots. They're going to get in there. They ain't coming back out. And they didn't. They perished. You see what God did when he made a way? He made a way for them to get out of Egypt and rest, knowing that the enemy was not coming back. I said that there would be an application. When we come out of bondage, when we 
as Christians accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, okay? I wonder sometimes if we, we miss something by simply saying, well, I got saved. Well, I know what you mean when you said that. But there's a transaction that takes place. We, 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 we get, make Jesus the Lord and Savior of our life. And when that happens, we are released from the bondage of Satan and sin and death. Released. And Satan can't do a thing about it. God makes a way for them to get out of bondage, but that's not the end of the story. Forty years they wandered in the wilderness because of their disobedience to God. And we know some of the stupid stories. I say stupid because, you know, why would, why would they keep doing the same dumb things over and over again? God never changes. God was holy when they left. He's still holy. Why would you keep doing these dumb things? But they did. And so they were 40 years in a trip that didn't need to take near that long. Probably could have done it in a half a year. 40 years, and now, all the trials and tribulations later, they're on the other side of the Jordan River. They've wandered all the way around the Sinai Peninsula. They've gone up the east side of the Jordan River. They've actually conquered some... Uh, of the uh, inhabitants of the land on the east side of the Jordan River, and now they're going to cross over and acquire what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never acquired, the promised land. But there's a body of water in the way. And so God needs to provide a way in to the promised land, out of bondage and in to the promised land. Joshua chapter 3, verse 7. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Uh, Joshua was one of only two of the representative spies from the 12 tribes of, of uh, Israel that went and spied out the land in the first year of their exodus. Ten of the twelve said, we can't go in there. Then people are big, bad, and we can't do it. Joshua and Caleb said, yes, we can. Joshua and Caleb lived to see the day that they would come into the promised land. None of the rest of them did. Joshua was always there. He was always faithful and always willing to let Moses lead. But Moses is gone. Moses has died on the other side of the Jordan. God buried him. Don't ask me where. I can't tell you that. And now it's up to Joshua. And I've got to believe that there was a little bit of, I wouldn't say fear, but, you know, let's face it, Moses has been the leader for 40 years. I am thankful that in the United States of America, we've never had a president for 40 years. I don't care who they are. But Moses had been the symbol of leadership for people that needed leadership. They looked to Joshua, and God says, don't worry, Joshua, I got this. He said, I'm going, to, I'm going to exalt you above the people. They're going to know that I'm with you just like I was with Moses. He said, you shall command the priest who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. Now, Joshua said to the children of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord. He says, by this... You shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, Perizzites and Girgashites, Amorites and Jebusites. Gosh, I wish Michael Franklin was here to say those. Don't tell him I said that. And so, there's a plan. The priests are going to go first. They're going to be carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They're going to step in the water. Everybody's going to come behind it. They probably are rolling their eyes saying, okay, watch what happens. Chapter 3, verse 17. Then the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Sound familiar? Many of the people that experienced this second miracle were not present 
when the first one took place. And most of those who were present when the first one took place died in the wilderness before the second. Joshua saw them both. I mean, in an almost matter-of-fact fashion, the Bible says God just simply did what he said he was going to do. He made a way where there was no way. And so he, 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 he made a way for the promised people to leave bondage and for the promised people to enter into the promise. Now, you and I, when we become Christians, we not only escape the bondage, that's the great thing, right? The bondage of sin, death, and Satan, we escaped all that. But we also enter in. We enter into new life and the promise of eternal life. Out of one and into the other. Now, for the children of Israel, it took 40 years in between times. For you and I as Christians, it happens immediately. Praise God, absolutely. It happens. You see, and and this is because this is because God loves us. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. Let me tell you something. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. How many of you can say the same thing? That God could save a wretch such as I took a miracle. Now, I won't say that Satan is not still back there pecking away at my heels once in a while. Maybe that's not your experience. I won't say that I never have worries or cares. I would be lying to you, and I don't like to lie in church. I don't think you'd have me back again. But I know that I have been saved. I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. I'm not going to realize the promised land our promised land, heaven, until I die or Jesus comes back and takes this up in the air. But I know it's there, I know it's real, and I know I have a reservation. Now, you ought to get excited about that kind of stuff. Now, I said that we would start out in in the Old Testament, we're going to come back into the New Testament because... There are some things I want to point out, just some, just some, some things for us to meditate on, okay? Just for things for us to meditate on. And by the way, let me say this, that these are true miracles, okay? The Bible has recorded historical events for us. They're not, they're, they're not just tales, fables, meant to make a point. Even though I've applied them to our situation as Christians, the message in the, the God, in, in the Bible narrative is, on such and such a day, God did this for real. This is the kind of God we serve, the kind of God that can do this. Um, we all know people. I, I shouldn't say, I've I got to be careful about superlatives. Most of us know someone who's not saved. And they're still waiting for that miracle to happen. Now, I will say this. Those children of Israel, had they not got up and walked across, they would have gone back to Egypt, and they would have served Pharaoh back there, and that had been the end of it. They didn't have a whole lot of faith, but they had enough when the water stood up to move. You and I know people that are not saved and don't want to be saved. Maybe you've even known somebody that has voiced this concern. Things were better for me before I became a Christian. Now, that's pretty rare, I'll admit, because most people wouldn't say that even if they really believed it. But what they usually mean by that is, well, my, I just changed some things up in my life, and, you know, I don't have the same fun as I used to have. I have a lot more fun than I did when I was unsaved, I will tell you that. But some people just, they don't want 
They don't want to commit to Jesus Christ for the rest of their life. You see, because they understand, I'll give them credit for this, they understand the transaction. It's not just Savior. That's the easy part, but Lord and Savior. Well, I don't mind taking the salvation, but I don't want Jesus telling me what to do. And we really understand, you know, and, and I think that we, uh, we, we need to be clear when we're witnessing to somebody, let them know that this is a transaction. His life for yours, your life for him. It's a pretty simple transaction, really. Uh, but there are people that we could be praying for. They're stuck in Egypt. They need out. They need to have that assurance that what is in the past is as far as the east is from the west and that what lies in the future is heaven eternally. We need to share that with them. And here, may I say this? We need to live that way ourselves. People need to see that in us. I'm going to tell you something. I have been through some tough times. I don't think that I'm the only one in the room. but I know where I stand in eternity and I would not trade it for all the money in the world. Um, oh, I, I, I'm preaching. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right, 2 Corinthians. Now, most of these verses you know, but I'm going I'm to say this is, this is our experience as Christians, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Even though I got page markers, I still can't get there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So just as the children of Israel left the bondage and entered the promised land, when we become Christians, we're brand new. All the stuff in the past is gone. Everything's become new. We need to live that way. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You see, we've been changed, but we have a mission, and that's to communicate that, me that message of reconciliation to the people that need to hear it. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, I could read the whole thing, but I don't want to take that much time. This is Paul, and he's back and forth with questions. Well, should we do this then? Heaven forbid. And, well, what about that? No, no, no. You know, and this kind of stuff, as he's wrestling with the reality of salvation. Because even though God saves us, just as he saved nation Israel, that doesn't mean that everything inside of us changes automatically. And so he, he, Paul was a pretty spiritual guy, and he struggled. I'm just telling you. He said so, not me. In, in Romans 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, get this, who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Skip down to verse 17. God be thanked that though you were slaves, not of Pharaoh, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Newness of life, slaves of righteousness. That's, that's, that's you and I. And that's where we should be. We should never be thinking about going back. First, uh, First Corinthians 10.13 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape. 
He will make a way when there seems no way that you may be able to bear it. May I say this to you? There are a lot of different kinds of temptations. For some reason in, in middle America these days, temptation always seems to be sensual. But there's a lot of temptations. And as we become more mature in our Christian faith, don't think that you're not going to be tempted in some ways. But God is faithful. He, he, he will give you what you need to overcome that temptation. Whatever it is. I don't know. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. I take that. You know, since Jesus said it, I kind of take it as a fact, right? With God, some things are possible. No, with, with God, all things are possible. I've relied on those all things more than once. I just want you to know that. Last thing I want to look at is in Philippians. Well, I've quoted this one probably a couple hundred times. You've, none of these are new passages to any of you. You've seen them, I'm sure, before. In Philippians chapter 3, and again, this is Paul talking about, hey, I thought I had it all. I thought I had it all lined out. I was doing pretty good. I was cool. Everybody liked me. You know, I was the cleanest whistle in the land. And every bit of it was worthless. When he came to realize every bit of it really was worthless, it was not going to draw him one step closer to heaven until he trusted in God's miracle. And God made a way where there appeared to be no way. And he says this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I've already attained or, or taken hold of, obtained, whatever, or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me. Folks, we never get to the point where we don't have to press on. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, one thing, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That should be a, a, a daily prayer. Maybe not those words, but you get it. I have not yet arrived, but as long as I have breath in my lungs and until the day that I walk into heaven, I want to press on. I want to be someone that Jesus Christ will welcome into the kingdom with a well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, we thank you for your word, for its challenges from the Old Testament and new. We Pray that you'll help us to commit these words to our, our prayers, meditations, so that we may truly apprehend what you want us to apprehend in, in your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.